Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this press conference from the 49th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. It's day number three or four, depending on how you count. And you're joining a press conference that's dedicated to answering the question, how can we move to more sustainable consumption? It's a, it's a pretty big question. It's a, it's a wide question. Uh, so I'm very happy that we're joined uh, by an expert panel today to try and answer that question. Um, but first uh, of all, allow me to set a little bit the context um, of, uh, of what we're trying to do here and uh, to highlight that this is part of a larger work stream of the World Economic Forum as well as the partners represented here. A couple of years ago, we launched a report with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that had the snappy data point that we will very soon have more plastic than fish in the ocean. And starting from that, um, we've uh, built together with the partners represented here, but also others, an, an effort, a multi-stakeholder effort to tackle these questions and to tackle that problem. Um, let me introduce uh, the panel to you uh, today. Um, to my immediate left, we're joined by Tom Zaki, who's the founder and chief executive officer of TerraCycle. To his left, uh, we're pleased to be joined by David Taylor, who's the chairman of the board, the president, and the CEO of P&G. Right at the heart and center of our panel uh, today, we're joined by Ramon Laguarta, the chairman-elect and chief executive officer of PepsiCo. To his immediate left, we're joined by James Rogers, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Appeal Sciences. And last, but definitely not least today, uh, we're joined uh, by Jennifer Morgan, who's the executive director of Greenpeace. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for being in the room, and thank you for watching, whether you're watching on Twitter, Facebook, or uh, our website. Uh, we're very happy that, you're, that you tuned in. Uh, Tom, um, let's, let's kick it off with you. Uh, so TerraCycle um, has a motto, and it's eliminating waste. That's a pretty ambitious uh, statement. Uh, I know it's a rich coming from the forum saying uh, where our motto is improving the state of the world, but still, um, it's an ambitious motto. Um, how can that be possible? It's a great question. Um, it's a real privilege to, uh, uh, privilege to be here. And uh, what TerraCycle does to try to eliminate the idea of waste is first try to look at making the objects we use today recyclable. Uh, we do this nationally across 21 countries. Everything from diaper recycling in partnership with uh, brands like Pampers, uh, all the way to chip bag or crisp bag recycling with brands like Walkers across the UK. So we try to make things that uh, uh, today don't have an option to be recycled. The second thing we try to do is try to have organizations integrate as much recycled material back into their products as absolutely possible. Two years ago, on this stage, we launched the world's first shampoo bottle made 25% from ocean plastic, and that has grown phenomenally with our partners at Procter & Gamble. Um, and these goals, what we have at TerraCycle in a humble way, echo the amazing and I think really inspiring commitments that organizations like the ones to my left, but many others have made with the Alan MacArthur Foundation to make their packaging recyclable and from very large percentages of recycled content in the coming years. Now, two years ago, uh, with uh, a small group of organizations uh, led by Procter & Gamble, PepsiCo, Nestle, Unilever, Mars, and Carrefour, we asked the question, is recycling and making from recycled materials the only way to solve waste? And we tried to create uh, or think about some alternatives to solve waste at the root cause, to challenge the idea of single use. And that is how the Loop Alliance was born, which I'm incredibly thrilled to be unveiling here today to you all, which is about offering an alternative to disposability by shifting ownership of the everyday products we buy from the consumer to the manufacturer. And by shifting ownership, three amazing things happen, uh, allowing durable design to uh, take place. The first is products move from being disposable, where the very best option is recycling, to durable, where the key method of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of cycling it is reuse. Second, it allows for unbelievable design innovation uh, uh, to come to life, using beautiful materials from alloys to glass to engineered plastics and also even allows new features uh, uh, to be put into products that were never possible before. Uh, like with Nestle and their haagen container, it keeps your ice cream frozen on the go, something that was never possible before. But this type of work can only occur when all the stakeholders come together. Uh, uh, major uh, producers, retailers, even industrial companies like UPS and Suez, all taking part to help bring this option to consumers. And now that this is available, I think the key is for uh, those out there listening is to vote with your dollar um, for the future you want. Because you know, we vote multiple times a day with actual money 
on what we want to live in tomorrow. And I think if consumers take that really, you know, that responsibility seriously, we can wake up in a much better place. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, David, you looked at, at Tom's ideas and uh, you obviously decided it's not completely crazy to, uh, to, to, to achieve that. Um, so um, at PNG, you've been an early supporter of the efforts yes. here uh, on the platform of the World Economic Forum. Share your perspective. Um, what do you think, uh, which criteria does Tom, uh, which, which criteria does he need to fit to, to make you believe that this is possible? Well, first, Tom has a lot of great ideas and we've partnered with him before in his company and frankly, it's bringing very innovative solutions to address very difficult problems that we have in society. So it's a pleasure, again, to be working uh, along with many other fine companies and organizations. Because the truth is, as Tom said, this is going to take multi-stakeholders to address. We've been working for years looking at many different solutions. We're committed to changing, whether it's our design or working with solutions like Loop with durable solutions, or recycling solutions, all of those are going to be important. As we think about this one, it's exciting in many ways, and there's some challenges. So we've got a test, two tests, that will be going initially um, in New York and Paris, because what we have to learn is any change in consumer behavior required. But we're going to set it up in a way where we think it can be convenient and affordable for consumers to take charge of this and then give back the packaging so it can be sanitized and then returned to them. So to me, this offers some amazing opportunities to eliminate waste in the environment and to delight the consumer. And as Tom said, it opens up some additional performance options for the consumers to experience. So I do believe this is addressable, but we're going to learn. And the reason we want to get out there is we're going to learn about the business model. We're going to learn about the consumer reaction to this. And from that, we can pivot and then find solutions that last. Because ultimately, it's going to take many different efforts across many different avenues for us to address plastic in the environment. Thank you, David. Uh, Roman, just like David, you run a company uh, that is, has been engaged on the platform, uh, but that is also kind of a crucial part of, of any solution. So um, David mentioned some, some pilot projects in, in Paris and New York. What's your sense of the timeline? How quickly can we get to a point where we can answer, answer the question of this press conference and yeah. say we moved a good step towards uh, more uh, sustainable consumption? Listen, we, we, I mean, first of all, it's pretty exciting that we're this is an idea that we thought about it, whatever, two years ago, I think it was, and we started to think about it, brought it to reality, and, and today we're launching to all of you, thanks to you know, a lot of stakeholders. So, it, and, and so the ideation and, and the, you know, we had to engage retailers, it was a long process. Now, as, as David was saying, I think the, um, the challenge here will be the business model and the consumer reaction, the consumer behavior to all of these. I think we've given consumers um, a lot of convenience with plastic. So a lot of functionality uh, at a low price. And that's made consumers' life very easy. Now we need to understand what are the reactions of consumers to solutions that might require a bit more effort on their side and a bit more cost. Uh, and, and that might take time. And we will, like, like any innovation, any new business model, we're going to trial and error. We're going to have to uh, adjust as we go, and we're going to have to be agile in, in providing new solutions. Uh, but we see this as a set of solutions. Like if you think about PepsiCo, we're on the one hand trying to reduce the plastic we use in all designs, and, and uh, you know we have some good innovations coming our way in that area. Thinking about recycling and thinking about reinventing, and the reinvention is is where you know, this loop uh, exciting project falls in. We we just bought SodaStream a few uh, months ago. That's another experiment that we have where we think new business models can help us solve for for a bigger problem. So I don't know the timeline. I, I'm, but we are, I'm, we're putting a lot of resources, a lot of uh, you know, good commercial people, good marketing people, to really understand what are the barriers from consumer point of, point of view, what are the economics of this model, and how we can make it convenient yet affordable, which I think is, is going to be the, the sweet spot of this solution. Thank you very much. Uh, James, uh, Tom is not the only person uh, on this panel who tries to, to put crazy ideas into action uh, to, to make this work. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do at Appeal and, and how it can help to redefine how we think about packaging and consumption today. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, at Appeal, we believe that the solutions that we need uh, to sustainable consumption have already been invented by the natural world. Uh, since the evolution of life on this planet has been about 3.8 billion years, and uh, that trial and error cycle that nature has been uh, trying again and again uh, has gotten us to the point where uh, nature is making uh, little, little pieces. Uh, it's using those pieces. Those pieces are going back out into the world, and then they're getting reconsumed and reused and recycled. 
Uh, we believe that nature has already created uh, the perfect packaging. Uh, when plants evolved out of water and onto land, the adaptation that allowed them to do that was the formation of this uh, thin plant skin. Uh, and that skin has been so important, it's been conserved between species. So every single surface of a plant is covered by uh, its own little packaging uh, material. Um, and we're just at a point now in human development where we have the ability and the tools to go look into the natural world to identify exactly those building blocks that nature is using, extract and isolate those materials, and use them to create solutions that don't cause problems when we reintroduce them to the world. Um, so at Appeal, uh, we develop plant-based solutions uh, that allow us to extend the shelf life of fresh produce to start with um, without the use uh, of refrigeration and the, without the use uh, of plastics. Um, and by doing this, uh, we're able to, uh, you know, today we're using about 80% of our fresh water to irrigate, a third of our energy production uh, for agriculture, about 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions, and about 5 billion pounds of pesticides to produce food, and then we're, estimates are we're throwing away about half of that. Um, and so what we do is by taking these materials um, out of the natural world, use them to augment the natural protective barrier that's on the skin of fresh fruits and vegetables, we can reduce the rate that those fruits spoil. Um, and in so doing, uh, we can be better stewards um, of the natural environment and do it by using materials uh, which nature already has the perfect recycling system for. Thank you, James. Jennifer, we heard this week already from both the youngest and the oldest participant uh, of this annual meeting from Sir David Attenborough from Greater Thunberg. Um, how urgent action on these questions is. And you yourself made it very clear that we're facing uh, a, a problem and challenges of, of, of vast proportions. Um, there's a lot of excitement uh, from your pan uh, fellow panelists. Uh, let's hear your perspective uh, on the issue and, and what do you think needs to happen next? Well, thanks. And it's good to be um, part, of a, part of the panel and having watched the Loop Alliance and other efforts along the way um, to have a chance to um, interact a bit um, here. I mean, I think just to start, the, the urgency around the, the science of, of climate change and certainly consumption, the use of the plastics, our throwaway culture, um, is something that I think the youth and the elders of the world are basically coming in to Davos as strongly as they can and bringing every bit of their heart and soul um, to ask people to dig deep uh, and to make individual commitments to stay below 1.5 degrees, and this discussion is part of that. Um, and so I hope that everyone here on the panel will take Greta's pledge, which she asked, which was to do everything that every person here can do to um, stay below 1.5, and that includes engaging in political debates domestically, which can be very challenging, but are absolutely uh, important. And I think what we feel uh, at Greenpeace is that really, the conversations this week should be on a shared recognition that our current economic system, which is based on this endless consumption, the disposability and the ongoing extraction of fossil fuels, is broken. And it just can't continue this way. We have to do things differently and better. So Greenpeace supports the intention um, behind these efforts um, that we've heard about today by the corporate sector. But we actually also, and, and I heard Ramon mention this, but we call on every company to take action in their own businesses to reduce production of single-use plastic. We cannot recycle our way out of this problem. So the reduction is absolutely important. We also welcome the continued investment um, and innovation in this space. We have to make sure that when we try something else, we don't create new problems, but I think we all know that. Um, so I think that's very important. And I think um, the vision behind um, these initiatives we're hearing really point to the importance of a comprehensive systems change that's required to build a sustainable and equitable future. So the innovation, the reduction, but also um, different systems of how to refill, how to reuse in ways that may seem old fashioned to some, but we need to either bring back uh, and make possible. And I think having that be a big part of this is important. So we see that, but at the same time, we actually see that many businesses behind these initiatives and others are expanding their production of single use plastic, and they're looking to grow in markets that simply can't take more plastic, right? And so I think having that global perspective, setting these global reduction targets is very important. I'm very glad you brought food um, into the conversation because 
you know, a third of food produced is, is not consumed. And I think plastic packaging is sometimes heralded as this means of avoiding food waste. Um, but it hasn't, uh, according to new studies, um, provided that kind of comprehensive solution. So um, growth in the application of plastic packaging has actually increased along that growth of food waste. So we need different approaches there, that's clear. And so I think just in, clo in closing, it's, it's very important that the Loop Alliance and other efforts um, to create these new business models are matched by immediate and urgent action from the companies to reduce the production of single-use plastics. There's a directive coming in in the European Union. Uh, we think those should be backed by national targets as well. We would call on all the companies here to support uh, those types of national reduction targets. Um, and everyone here has an important role to fill. And I think without that um, kind of individual company commitments and moving forward and signaling that, engaging in, in national political and international political debates, there's a real risk that projects like this become a bit of a distracting side show uh, to generate positive PR and um, while major companies continue business as usual. So prove me wrong on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, Ramon, David, let me give you a chance to become really un unpopular with your fellow business leaders here, here in Davos. Um, you're obviously here. You're showing your commitment. You acknowledge the, the challenges. Um, and we've seen on media coverage and social media about this summit that climate, pollution, biodiversity, these issues are at the absolute forefront of everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. um, do you get the sense from your fellow CEOs here in Davos that this message has reached their thinking? Yes, I just came out of a, a, a forum with a number of uh, members of the consumer industry, both retailers and manufacturers, and the, and the discussion was very much on these points, the fact that we had to work together with other stakeholders to not only work the design, and it needs to go all the way in the front end of innovation. We need to be looking at ways to meet the consumer's need that does use less plastic. We also need to look at ways for that which requires plastic now to we can invent something else that it is recycled. And we need to look at solutions like this and be ready to lend technology and financial support to these kind of pilots to find solutions. A durable solution would be an outstanding way to meet consumers' needs. And there'll be some areas where we may not be able to use that. So I think there's gonna be many solutions. What is, to me, very encouraging is representatives across the whole value chain are willing to put their technology and resources, financial and leadership, to start to work on some of these. And many have come up just in the last two years. The dialogue mm -hmm. has changed. And you're seeing companies step up and want to partner with NGOs and municipalities to try new solutions. So I'm encouraged. And I think the one here today, Loop, is just a, a great illustration because it pushes it even further. It's not about recycling. It's about getting it where it's a durable, and you can create a truly, a truly circular system. And done well, it'll be as convenient, and it'll be as affordable, and it'll be better performance of the products. The experience will be a positive experience, and it will be one that it significantly reduces the environmental footprint of the total process. So I'm actually very excited about this, and I do believe members of the industry see the compelling need to work together to find solutions across many different, many different ways. Yeah. Thank you, Ramon. You want to add to that? We've been in, we've been in many meetings with David this week, actually, and um, I see two two areas of work that I think uh, make me very positive. I think uh, David very positive. One is uh, if you think about this on a vertical level, every company, uh, if you compare with last year or two years ago. Uh, clearly, the, the, the share of conversations around plastics, the share of investments, the, um, the willingness to reduce plastic in each one of our companies, and the areas we control is very clear. So we're all making commitments. There's a reduction and the use of recyclable. So on the vertical side, I, th I think all the large companies are very committed. Now on the horizontal side, I th that's what makes me really positive. We, and we've made a lot of traction in the last, last six months on how we bring the overall supply chain to the table. So this is from uh, the, chemist, the chemical companies that produce the, uh, the plastic to the big brand companies, to the recycling companies, to the governments, to NGOs. I think there's a lot of forums that there's not only conversations, but there are actual actions being 
defined uh, with very concrete outputs <coughs> and timelines and investments behind them. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of traction both on the vertical side, horizontal side, because we, we all agree that this is not a, a heroic performance by any of the companies. We can, nobody of us can solve this by, by one heroic effort. It has to be a very systemic effort to, uh, to reduce plastics. And, and we all have a similar vision, which is make sure that plastic does not go to waste. So, I mean, that, that is the vision, and we all articulate it in different ways, but that's the same principle. So um, I think we're in a very good, um, very good place. This, to what we're presenting to you today, is one example of uh, multiple efforts in, in the area of innovation. And, and uh, I think innovation will, will help us with new materials, it will help us with new business models, it will help us with consumer education. So hopefully we, we, can, we can make it happen. Thank you. And uh, let's open the floor for questions and answers. We have a microphone here. Um, we have a question from the lady in the front. If you could identify yourself for the sake of our online audience, please. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I'm Julie Zhou from iPhone.com China. I would like to ask for the panelists about your perspective on China's refusing to be a dumping ground since last year uh, because they banned 24 scraps of waste uh, to you know, from the developed countries, including U.S., Japan, and EU. So what's, what's your view on it, and what's the solution if China refused to do that? Is it just moving the waste from one country to the other country, or do you have uh, any better option? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the question, um, I guess, makes this discussion even more urgent. Who wants to, to take well, a step? Exactly what we're talking about today is an example of a solution, which is what you want is less waste. And less waste will come from multiple solutions, whether it's loop, which is a durable, closed-loop circular system, which I think is outstanding, whether it's technologies that can be brought to bear, and we've got an example of polypropylene that may be contaminated, you can take back in a technology that turns it to near virgin quality, so then it's of higher value. So it could be recycled, and you could have a system where it generates the revenue to pay for the collection. Do we want to have more? No, what we want to do is have a variety of solutions where it can be durable, outstanding. Let's go learn and create those solutions. Where there's a, where the best right now solution until we develop new technology is in some form of plastic, ensure that the plastic can be recycled and make sure there is a total system, a recycling capability and a value chain that pays for the cost to collect and process it. All of these things, I think, will be part of the solution. And then we won't have to see where you shop plastic. What you want to do is eliminate completely plastic in the environment. What is the vision? No plastic in the environment. And, and ideally, we find solutions like Loop, which is an example where you're not putting anything back in because the durable that's used for the packaging, when it does become damaged and not usable, it's fully recyclable, and you can turn it back into another durable. So that's, a, that's to me, a, a great example of an option. But I think what we need to do is avoid moving things around. Let's get at the core cause, starting with design, but then while we do that, let's find solutions to deal with what we have today as well. Thank you. Jennifer, do you want to add to that, please? Yeah, I, I actually think um, I, I understand completely why China did what it did, and I'm grateful that it has exposed the situation, because I can tell you if you look in, for example, German newspapers that are now covering this issue extensively, most of the good German citizens who recycle have no idea that there is a recycling trade and that what they do gets shipped abroad. So I think exposing that is incredibly important. But I want to come back to this reduction piece, because I don't feel like we're all on the same page there yet. We have to have peak plastic. Get your heads around that. We can't recycle our way out of this. And, and I don't hear a lot about the role of government here and the role of directives and regulation and banning things, right? And there is, uh, on the European level, the beginnings of something there. But I think the um, getting that, you know, um, you know, David, the technology, yes, but if we don't actually start immediately getting this stuff reducing, right? So getting... And that's what Loop is designed to do. So is PNG committing to set a reduction target of plastics across your entire supply chain? I hear Pepsi is interested or looking at that. You're looking at it. 
I want, you know, that's what I think is, is needed right now. 6%, my understanding, by some calculations of the emissions from or the fossil fuel use from plastics uh, globally is 6% of global emissions. That's the same as aviation, right? So I would really like to see corporate commitments. And then I think, you know, the, the, um, then we need to deal with it at, at home, not be exporting it, obviously, elsewhere. The, um, you know, as, as, as we look at this target, right, yeah. and, and, and we have two different industries, right? We're in the snack business and we're in the uh, beverage mm. business. So when, when you think about the um, beverage business, um, what we're trying to do is obviously design the bottles so that it has the minimum amount of plastic, and then moving our mix stores, cans, stores, uh, glass, etc. However, to your point on the 1.5 degrees, the equation is not so simple. So, you know, um, no, it's very complex. So when, when you start thinking no about glass and returnable glass, then you say, okay, well, then I'm going to drive a lot of miles back into the factory. So we're, we're looking at all these combinations. What is the ideal combination of packaging that provides consumers the right solutions, minimize the environmental challenges, not only in a, from a plastic point of view, from a more holistic mm -hmm. uh, um, CO2 as well. Uh, when it comes to snacks, it's easier. Mm. And we have technologies that uh, we'll, we're going to roll out some new technologies next year that will really reduce the, um, the amount of packaging we use per, let's say, per kilo of right. product, right? So th that's a simple category. Um, beverage is a bit more complex. Right. Thank you. Tom, please. First, I, I'd like to thank you for, for the advocacy because the, uh, by NGOs advocating in the way you're hearing today, but also consumers waking up, I think this year, 2000 or, or last year, 2018, the people of the world spoke out against these topics in a very clear uh, uh, way. We saw plastic straws uh, uh, get affected around the world, but we also saw this topic elevate and especially maintain. And this is so important, uh, the role of the individual here, because that's what allows small organizations uh, like ours and the other one that you've heard on stage today to be able to come up with bold, uh, innovative ideas, and then especially the organizations that have the means, the knowledge, and the capability to execute against them. To me, it's been so inspiring walking in the halls of your, your various offices and being taken exceptionally seriously, uh, 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 and then major uh, um, uh, uh, resources being committed in a blistering pace uh, to bring it out. And uh, uh, I just want to echo another point that you said earlier, is there's a lot of wisdom in our past, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of innovation always looks forward. But I think we also have to turn and look behind us because waste is a modern idea. Uh, it came about in the 50s. And before that, um, mil you know, uh, uh, models like the Milkman uh, did really well. And uh, Loop, in a way, is a reboot uh, 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 of the Milkman. Um, and it's a little bit looking forward and looking back. Uh, because this concept of waste hasn't been with us forever. It's new. Uh, uh, it won uh, uh, the market because of its incredible convenience and affordability. But I think with all the innovation and all the great minds and resources and commitment to it, it's, it's definitely not just talk, um, uh, we can bring out models of the future. Uh, and my dream is that my kids or their kids can wake up in a world where the idea of waste simply doesn't exist. Mm. And we look at this time in history as what an anomaly that was, and thank God we're not in it anymore. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can. Oh, sorry, one please. Request before we finish, um, if you guys write a lot about Loop, you will help us. So um, you know, one of the challenges of these initiatives is how do we get consumer awareness, right? How do we get consumers to adopt this as their solution of choice for all the different products? So. Please write a lot about this. I mean, help us. Help us. You know, make it big. Make it, especially in Paris, New York, and London, right? Like, help us with this because I think we're all together, and you're part of the system as well. Yeah. Let's see if we have uh, time for one quick question. If there is one, um, yes, there's a gentleman in the back. If we could get the microphone over there, please. Um, thank you. Um, just to go back to the earlier point, as as big big companies in, and and uh, users of plastic, is it not? Could, Basically, give us an idea of how much plastic you consume in your business a year and whether you can set a target, a long-term target, for peak plastic in your business. Thank you. If you could also identify yourself for the sake of our online audience, please. Sorry. I thought, uh, my name's Mark, Mark Bendai from Reuters. Thank you, Mark. So I think, Ramon, you already mentioned that uh, you're, you're looking at all these different we're, aspects. We're looking at, um, th this is a very holistic, uh, we don't want to just um, commit ourselves to a target reduction. We're, we're thinking of this much, much more holistically around the whole environmental challenge, and that includes climate and everything else. So 
um, uh, yes, it's doable. It's, we have the willingness to do it, and uh, we will do it eventually. <clears throat> the, the same is we have technologies, and this is to me where we're going to find great solutions. An, an example, we have something called Aeroflex packaging for e-commerce shipments. 50% less plastic. While we do work on other solutions, take it down by 50% on packaging for e-commerce. Think about that. Using air and then some structured plastic that can be recycled. But you take 50% out now when you do that. That's something we've been investing in. So there's a number of examples. I don't know the weight of all of the plastic that we have, but the idea is address the consumer need with creative solutions. Loop is an example. Aeroflex packaging is an example. Each of these is looking at design, find better ways to deliver the consumer benefit, ideally give them better benefits, but find circular solutions for those. Because we all want to end live in a world with zero plastic waste. I think what Tom is saying is even more broadly looking at, can we eliminate waste in the environment and create circular solutions? There's a lot of energy, and it is going to take multiple stakeholders bringing our technology and our financial resources and, our, and partnering with others that are like-minded. So I'm actually very encouraged by the progress that I've seen this week because there's many stakeholders that are ready to really lean in beyond advocacy, ready to bring technology to bear so there's concrete solutions and pilot starting this year in multiple cities on this, pilot starting this year on other solutions that reduce the plastic that's going in the environment. Collectively, will make a meaningful difference. Jennifer, please. Yeah, just two quick points. One quick, um, the transparency issue is actually huge. So I think another piece of this that we certainly are looking at is, you know, how are companies reporting um, and being transparent about what's going on so that consumers can then know. Uh, and the second is just to share uh, a quick story, because as the head of Greenpeace, I have the amazing privilege of meeting our activists and our volunteers. And I sat next to a, a woman recently in Taiwan, and she said, I'm living a plastic-free life. And I said, wow. How are you doing that? And she said, and I have a community of 20,000, which is, you know, who sit, and they go with their refillables. They go um, into the night market, right? So consumers and young people want this. And I think, so the, the flip side of that, though, is, and we'll be coming more and more, and I think speaking with what they want to buy and how they do that. But the importance of getting the, the peak plastic and the reductions and the bans legally in place, I don't have time much more for public-private partnerships alone. We've got 12 years left on climate to avoid 1.5. So please work also to get the right policies in place. Uh, thanks. Thank you. James, before we close, quick question to you. How difficult is it to scale these solutions? Uh, <clears throat> given the, the, the scale, at least, you know, we're tackling first in the food system, um, y y tremendous volumes of, of fresh produce being produced around the world. And so, um, you know, our business uh, is effectively that, going to those regions in which uh, we have uh, fresh produce being uh, produced. Those regions are, are often uh, widely separated from uh, consumption regions. And so we go into those regions. Uh, we install our application systems, which allow us to apply uh, this plant-based technology, which allows us to reduce uh, fuel use uh, from refrigeration cost uh, for transport, um, and at the same time uh, reduces losses in the system. So ultimately, uh, we, we need to uh, produce less to be able to, to feed the same number of people. And so I would uh, just add to this conversation that uh, we've actually found that uh, waste reduction is good business. Uh, it doesn't, the, the, the two are not separated. And the world that we're living in today, uh, consumers are both looking for waste reduction and it ends up affecting the bottom line um, of, of everyone's business uh, seated at the table here. And so um, in, 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 by, by applying this plant-based technology, um, <laughs> by, by extending the shelf life of fresh produce in a natural way, uh, we've been able to reduce waste on store shelves uh, by more than 50% in every program uh, that we've run. And that translates all the way on, onto consumers' uh, countertops at home. So I just want to just close and, and just say that, uh, you know, I, I think that waste reduction um, 
it actually makes sense uh, business-wise, uh, not only uh, from a policy perspective. Thank you very much. And I want to use this opportunity to also give a shout out to one of our co-chairs, Akira Sakano from Japan, who is working with her small community to be the first uh, zero waste community in Japan. She already managed to get to 80% waste reduction in Japan. So it is possible. Uh, and on that positive note, thank you very much to my panelists. And thank you all for watching and thank being you. here. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Thank you.